Welcome back. In the last video, I finished up the bottom end rebuild. Now it's time to move on to the cylinder head. The first order of business is to take the camshafts out. This needs to be done carefully to make sure the camshaft doesn't bend at all. You'll see what I mean with the next camshaft. First, I engage as few of the cam lobes as possible. This, of course, opens some valves so the head is propped up in blocks. Then, I take off all the caps farthest from the engaged lobes. Finally, I can slowly alternate between the last two caps without letting the cam bend. With the cams out, I can take the trays out. I turn the head over so the lifter buckets don't fall all over the place. With a little persuasion, the trays come out. It's important not to mix up where the lifters go. The cams and trays are labeled, so we won't mix those up. A is for exhaust and E is intake, weirdly enough. Now I can take a look at the camshafts. Just like every other M54 cam I've seen, these do have some scoring, especially towards the rear cylinders. This isn't a cause for alarm, it can be taken care of by making sure these scratches aren't convex. Next I take off bits like the cam sensor, thermostat, and coolant sensor. plug is still in, so it's time to take those out as well. They don't look too awful. Definitely burning some oil, though. Now comes the fun part. I have the spring compressor tool, which is essential for taking the valves out. It's not a complicated process, but there are 24 valves, so it takes a while. The compressor is set to the right height, and when it clamps, it compresses the spring. I can then get the two small retainers out with a magnet, and then I can release the clamp. The springs and hat come out, and then the valve can slide out the bottom. This is an intake valve, and it actually looks to be in good shape. I use a piece of cardboard to easily keep track of where the valves came from, because of course you don't want to mix them up, as they are matched to the seat. The springs and such go in an organizer, so I can keep track of those as well. It's not the end of the world to mix up the springs, but I organize them anyways. The process continues for quite some time, then I flip the head over to do the exhaust side. With all the valves out, I can move on to the valve stem seals. Do not use vice grips on these. Back in my 3 liter, I used vice grips, and I wound up crushing all the guides. I had to wrangle a whole new cylinder head out of a car from the junkyard, which is not something you want to do. Instead, these hose pliers work quite well. Some care is needed to prevent scratching on the brass guide, but you won't crush them. Some pop out a bit easier than others, but eventually they're all out. I almost forgot to take the oil galley plug out, so I removed that. It is essential to clean these oil passages in the head, especially after I hot tank it. Looking at the exposed valve seats, the intakes aren't bad, but the exhausts have a lot of carbon and the seats themselves are pitted. There's also a lot of varnish, which we'll need cleaning up. So I get a big tub and add some simple clean and hot water. It's always satisfying to see the varnish disappear at first. But don't let it fool you, the rest will take a lot more to get rid of. I scrub the head and trays that are letting it sit for a few hours. The head gasket material has been loosened up, so now is a good time to scrape it off. I have a scraper tool that uses plastic replaceable razor blades, which makes it a lot easier. While the head continues to soak, I move on to the lifters. I didn't do this in the 3 liter, but decided to do it for this one. These are hydraulic, and there's a plunger inside that can be popped out. I take all of them apart, keeping track of their parts. 
I let them drain their tray because there's a lot of oil in them. Then the cleaning process begins. I don't soak them because I don't want any rust. Rather, I use Q-tips and compressed air to make sure they're clean and not clogged. There's a small ball valve that lets fluid in, but not out, that needs to be cleaned. Definitely make sure you pay attention to how these come apart to make sure they go back together properly. Then I can reassemble the plunger and pop it back in with a soft hammer. When I go to put them back in the tray, I apply some oil. I make sure they fall into place smoothly by gravity alone, so they're not scratching or binding anywhere. Now I can move back to the cylinder head and scrape out some of that carbon. It's not perfect, and it never will be, and I have to call it quits at some point. I give it all a good rinse and a thorough dry to prevent corrosion. Then, since the tub is full anyways, I clean up the oil pan a bit, which we'll put on later. I should have done this sooner, but I decided to check the flatness of the cylinder head. I use a straight edge and a feeler gauge and multiple axes to make sure it's not warped. Now comes the time to install new valve stem seals. I get a socket that fits just right over the seal, and then I tap it into place in the guide, making sure it's fully seated. I'm doing this only for the intake valves for now, as I've decided they don't need any lapping. You'll see that for the exhaust, I will do the seals later. This is for two reasons. First, I want to be able to clean any and all grinding compound out of the guides without letting it get stuck in the seal. Second, which doesn't really apply here, is that taking a valve in and out a lot can damage a seal, but only really if it's been cut shorter at the end. This is done for engines, like my EJ, that don't have hydraulic or adjustable lifters, where the best way to adjust valve clearance is to machine the stem. This can leave sharp edges that can slice up the seals when you install them. Installing the valves is even worse than removing them. It's kind of the reverse, but it's tricky getting the retainers in place. I apply some oil to the stem, which makes the retainer stick a bit better. Then I get the first half on and twist it around to the other side. Then the second half can go on without popping the first one off. Sometimes it takes a few tries to get it on. But once they're on, the compressor can come off and it all stays together. Now, here's what the exhaust valves look like. This one has mountains of carbon on it, and the contact patch is all pitted. This will definitely need some cleanup. So, I use the old tape and drill method. Except this time, instead of using sandpaper, which isn't a good idea, I went out and bought a bench grinder with a wire wheel. I spin the valve in the opposite direction as the wire wheel, and it cleans up really nicely. The wire wheel is steel. Ideally it would be brass, but I couldn't find any. Steel is probably a lot better than sandpaper anyways. It doesn't leave any visible scratches, and the original machining marks are still visible. After cleanup, the valve looks almost new again, with the exception of the pitting. It's much easier to see just how badly these need some grinding now that there's no carbon on them. After cleaning them all up and keeping them organized, I can move on to the lapping process. This is also a tedious process, and it takes patience. I add some grinding compound to the contact area and stick my lapping tool on. The trick is to use minimum oil to help the tool stick. Too much and it'll pop off easily. After grinding for a few minutes, the valves look much better. The contact patch should be as thin as possible, which these aren't, but at least they're not pitted anymore. This is as good as you can get without an expensive valve job. This is a budget build after all. I clean up the grinding compound the best I can, using brake cleaner and more q-tips to make sure there's none left. 
Now the seals can be reinstalled before the valves go in. Then I oil up and insert my valves. If I don't feel buttery smooth, I clean out the guides over and over until I go in smoothly. Then I use my valve spring compressor to install the springs, just the same as the intakes. I then clean up the head gasket surface a bit more with some lacquer thinner. Then I install the trays with the lifters installed that we saw previously. The cam cap nuts are still dirty, so I put them in my ultrasonic cleaner with some simple green. Then, before installing the cams, I sand down those grooves and make sure they're not convex. Everything gets a liberal serving of assembly lube and the cams go in. Installing them is kind of the reverse of removing them. I install the caps closest to the engaged lobes alternating back and forth to prevent bending the cams. Then the rest of the cleaned up nuts go on. The process is the same for the exhaust side. When I turn the cams over, I'm careful that the valves don't contact each other because this can happen if all the valves in the same cylinder are open. Once again, the head is propped up so the valves don't hit the table. And actually, the valves won't open all the way anyways because the lifters aren't pumped up yet. So, after torquing down the cam cap nuts, the head is now ready to be installed on the engine block. I'll do the timing and everything later once it's on the engine. But for now, thanks for watching, feel free to like and subscribe, and see you in the next part where the engine gets reassembled.